Hello, and welcome to Crew Call, the Below the Line podcast by, for, and about the crew. On today's episode, we'll be speaking with the post production coordinator, Zach Moss. So, how are you doing today? Doing well, thanks. Um, just uh, got back from running around over the uh, at the office for you know getting everything set up. So you know how the first week is. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking the time today to to do a quick little interview. And uh, sure. Yay! So let's get started. Um, first of all, when did you get started in the business? Um, let's see. Going about. About five years now, um, I got an opportunity to be a set PA on Bones and um, did that for kind of a replacement gig for a PA that they'd lost. So I just kind of finished out the season. Um, And then when the next season was coming up, they gave me an opportunity to move into Um, post-production. Again, as a fill-in, their their post-coordinator had a family issue and their post-PA was filling in for the coordinator. And so I got to come in and learn post, and I enjoyed it a lot more than working on set. So I uh, uh, kind of stuck with that and put my name out there for other post PA gigs, and you know, little by little, you know, got other work on various shows, and you know, um, kept working. Awesome. So, like the first time, how did you how did you break in? Actually, the old fashioned Hollywood way, which is uh, nepotism. Um, <laughs> my, uh, my father in law was actually an uh, executive producer, a co executive producer on Bones. So um, he gave me that first uh, first job. Nice if you can get it right. I mean, everyone needs somebody to give them the opportunity, mm-hmm. um, and I'm very I was very grateful for it. And he, you know, it wasn't this a circumstance where I've heard these horror stories about you know, people's family members that come in and they're terrible at the job. But they're not fireable. Mm-hmm. Um, but that, that was definitely not not my circumstance at all. You know, he made that very clear. Mm-hmm. Fortunately for me, you know, I got a, I got a start from, you know, somebody close to me, but, uh, I've been able to work, you know, just by hopefully being a, a good post-production PA and post-coordinator. <laughs> well, good. I like to hear that. So how about, uh, what is your job as a post-production coordinator? As a post-production coordinator, your job is basically to make sure that all the day-to-day functions of the post-production office happen. Everybody needs something and you need to make sure that they have it, whether it's um, the assistant editors who need to um, make various versions of the show and you need to make sure that they're aware of that and that they're, you know, putting it out into the world at the right time. Um, as well as, you know, a lot of just making sure that the PA knows where he or she needs to be and, uh, and what it is that they're picking up and dropping off and all that kind of stuff, making sure the post-production supervisor has everything that he needs as far as, uh, supplies and meeting schedule and things like that. And just basically making sure that the ship keeps sailing. Now, are you like a regular job as far as like your hours? Do you work set hours like nine to five or do you, um, come in early and then leave when everyone's done? How does, how are your hours for the job? The hours, uh, a standard post-production office kind of is a nine to seven sort okay. of thing. Um, so it, it has the upside, uh, you know, of being a much more regular mm-hmm. um, uh, work position as far as, as the TV industry is concerned. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, you don't get those opportunities for those big fat uh, overtime. Yeah. You know, as much. Mm-hmm. So um, there's a downside to it. But for me, you know, I, I, I like the regularity of it while still being involved in the craziness and creativity of, of the TV industry. Right. So, so you would say your typical day is just going to the office. You're, you, you start when you start and then you just have all these things that you have to coordinate and take care of for everyone. Correct. Yeah, you come. You're coming in. Uh, you know, making sure that um, you know everything's where it needs to be. Uh, checking your emails, sending out all the emails. There's always various meetings and and, and things like that that need to be scheduled and rescheduled and re rescheduled. And um, you know, various various office related chores. Yeah, absolutely. Who is in your department? What's the structure like of your department? Well, in the post production department, starting at the the bottom is of course the production assistant. Uh, and then right above that is the post-production coordinator. Uh, and then you'll have above that person is the post-production supervisor. And then generally the person in charge of the entire post-production office is an associate producer on bigger shows. You'll have someone 
who's a co-producer, uh, depending on the budget and all that kind of stuff. Uh, um, and then sometimes in the post-production supervisor slot, you'll have an associate producer. And generally, it's those four positions. Some big shows have five, but I don't think I've ever worked on one. And then it's also the, the editors and assistant editors are in the office as well. Does everybody report to one specific person or do people like report like at the bottom report to several different people or, you know what I mean, or just up to the next level? How does that work? It generally goes up to the next level in that the PA will be getting uh, his his marching orders uh, from the coordinator and generally won't need to, to get anything from the supervisor and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, there's, there's always... Uh, you know, various reasons why the the PA will be doing something for directly for the co-producer because he needs, you know, something somewhere. Mm -hmm. Um, But generally speaking, it does, it does go up that chain uh, that way. The, the head of the post-production department actually spends a lot of time elsewhere uh, handling either sound or visual effects or other picture related uh, color issues and things like that. So the, usually the person running the office is the post-production supervisor. Oh, okay. And he's kind of the one who deals with all of the, uh, you know, every if there's a crisis in the office, you know, he's kind of the one who can make the final call. Okay. So speaking of visual effects, uh, how does it affect your affect your job? Um, as a coordinator, mm-hmm. it uh, affects your job just because it's it's one more uh, facility. We're always dealing with a variety of uh, in post production. We're always dealing with a variety of facilities. Um, sound or picture or visual effects. And the more visual effects there are on a show, the more facilities, which means more drives, more destinations, more things to keep track of. Mm-hmm. Um, generally speaking, visual effects on a, on a show that has a lot of visual effects, they have their own department, okay. which, will, which will handle a lot of that stuff. But it, it will fall to the post-production PA to do all the runs and all the deliveries and all that kind of stuff. Now, do you interact with the editors at all? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, I mean, the editors, much more so the assistant editors than the editors. Oh, okay. Uh, editors kind of have their, they get to do their own thing mm-hmm. uh, in that, you know, they they cut the dailies as the show's being shot. And then, you know, they put out their cut without really anybody telling them what to do. Whereas uh, post-production, there's always somebody who needs to see a version of the show or maybe just a scene or something like that for for inserts or for continuity or some other purpose. So we're always giving out clips of the show and that you'll kind of give the assistant editor, you'll let them know that they need to make that and, uh, you know, who it needs to go to and that kind of stuff. So speaking of that, how many versions or cuts does a typical episode go through? Well, the, the first cut, the first pass will be the editor's cut. And like I said, they do that completely unsupervised. They, they cut each day's dailies as that, as it comes to them. And once they've put together the complete show, the director comes in next and he will have three or four days to put in his version of the show and he'll have the ability to tell the editor, you know, change this scene. I I prefer a different take. I prefer a different angle and stuff like that. Then it will go up to the producers who will go through with their cut. And, you know, the, the editor at that point stops having as much of a creative role as more as they're serving the desires of the producers. They they've done their cut They've given out their version, and the producers have the right and ability and authority to say change everything, and you know, and and go back to dailies and do this, this, and this. They then send it to the producing studio, who will give notes and uh, critiques and and things that they they need explained to them, or you know, things that they need improved. Mm-hmm. Um, and then from the studio, their cut goes to the network. And that is the final version. Wow. And then the network will say, you know, what they want. And then that gets, is what gets aired. So it's just a lot of work. And, and speaking of that, so then how do you keep track if like there's multiple episodes going on and, and they're, at, they're at different stages of completion? Is that like a really hard thing to do? Is that something that you help with? That's, that's very much the, the, an important part of the post-production uh, coordinator's job is keeping track of what episodes are in what version mm-hmm. and, and making sure that uh, the schedule is being followed. Uh, the post, the, the head of the post-production department, co-producer, or associate producer, will put out a schedule and, you know, he 
or she expects that to be followed. And it's, it's the coordinator's job to make sure that all of the cuts and uh, in a, in a functioning office, everyone's doing what they need to do every day. So these things happen, yeah. but um, you know, it's, it's up to the coordinator to, to be on top of it, to know the schedule, you know, better than basically anybody else. And to, to make sure that, that every, cause in a, in a given day, it's, you'll probably be dealing with three, three episodes okay. in various, you know, forms. One will be shooting, one will be in, a, you know, uh, early stages of cuts, editors and directors. And then another one will be more towards final, you know, uh, studio or, or network version. Yeah. Okay. So, so what things are the, what tasks are most difficult to perform in your job? Like what, what's the, what's the hardest, what's the easiest? The hardest thing for the post coordinator to do is scheduling actors for ADR. Okay. Can you explain for the audience, for our listeners, what ADR is? Uh, ADR is automated dialogue replacement, or some other people say it's additional uh, dialogue replacement. Um, this is not done on the production day. This is done later. And it's basically the process of after the fact, recording uh, more dialogue, actors speaking, and then marrying that recorded audio with uh, a shot. And a lot of times there are ADR issues because the producers want to change a story point. Mm -hmm. And so they need the actor to come in and, and say an entirely different line than what they recorded on that initial day. Oftentimes, though, actors don't want to come in because this ADR happens on their day off right. or it happens, you know, they're, they've they wrapped the show six weeks ago and now they're yeah. getting a phone call for ADR. And um, depending on on the show and the cast, I've, I've booked ADR, I think it was in three countries and four states on the same day. We had an actor who, who lived in Serbia <laughs> when he wasn't shooting. <laughs> and the show was shot in Vancouver. So, uh, of course, you know, I mean, at least at the same time zone, but, you know, yeah. you had to get all the Canadian actors. And uh, then, of course, there's always a British actor who's in London and, you know, something <laughs> along those lines. So you're always, <laughs> and then on, on uh, <laughs> you know, sometimes they'll be on vacation in Hawaii and it's literally the only time we can get them. And we have to book a, an ADR stage in Hawaii, oh, you geez. know, and find somebody somewhere and get the actor off the beach and into the recording booth for, you know, maybe just a half an hour of their time, you know, a half right. an hour of recording time, but it's, it's gotta happen. It has to happen, but it's frustrating for the actors. It's frustrating for me because they don't want to do it. And I really want them to do it. it so, it's really a small um, price for them to pay for all the money that they make. So. They've already been paid for it. Technically it's in their contract that I don't have the exact details, but there's a certain number of ADR days that they owe the show. So in the best case scenario, they don't have to record any and they've gotten, they've already been paid for that worst case scenario. Right. Uh, you know, they have to do several hours of ADR, which I have had because the, the, you know, in the, in the cut, the producers were saying, Oh wow, we really have to change the story a lot. And ADR can really, really reshape the, the plot of a show. So, um, yeah. So one of our actresses had to come in and do, I think an additional, you know, two or three hours worth of dialogue recording, which is, you know, they, like I said, they don't, they're not fond of it. However, the ones who are generally speaking, your featured, featured extras and people who only had a line here mm -hmm. and there, they love to come in because it's an extra day of pay. I know, so, right? They're always, they're always happy to do it. They're like, you want me to stars, do more? You want me, I could do more. I could do someone else's lines. I <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You know, and, and, and sometimes they didn't have a line and now they have a line, you know, that's a big deal for a lot of actors. So, um, it's, you know, they, they are generally very, very willing and, and able to, to come in anywhere that they are in the world. Mm -hmm. The stars on the other hand, not so much. Um, some are great, some not so much, yeah, <laughs> but and that's far and away is, is, is the hardest thing because you're dealing with the actor's management and they want, they want you to be as flexible as you can, but you're not booking one actor, you're booking five actors Ugh. and you need to book them all at the same time on the same day. So you can, cause the state, the stage is, you know, several thousand dollars an hour and oh. you, you know, you you only, <laughs> you don't want to keep booking the stages. So, um, that's definitely, like I said, it's, that's been frustrating because, uh, you'll get actors all over the world, Mexico city, uh, Serbia, London, Vancouver, 
Albuquerque, New Mexico, yeah. you know, everywhere in the world. And you have to find the stage uh, somewhere that can record television quality dialogue and, uh, and, and get it done. So that can be tough. But it's also rewarding when you do get it done. It's really a good feeling when it happens. Well, so. now, now here's my question, though. If they're doing ADR and you're matching it to the, the film, but they're changing the lines, then how does that work? It's um, Anytime you see the back of an actor's head, Aha. they're likely not saying the, the lines that you gotcha. are hearing. Gotcha. They said something else. Okay. If you ever see somebody talking into a walkie-talkie and you can't see their lips moving, yeah. you can put anything in the world you want in there. Oh, okay. we, you know, I've changed. We had an actor who was French. Mm -hmm. They couldn't understand his accent. They made him American. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so it's any time that you can't really see the mouth move. Okay. Um, you can put anything you want in there and those, those over the shoulder shots, that's now your viewers be on the lookout for that. Okay. Um, because that's likely an ADR line is that they, they <laughs> re-recorded the dialogue, picked a, a different perspective on the actor. So you can put anything you want, you know? So now how detailed are the, the notes that you get the, the studio network notes? Do they change specific, shots or is it more general it's it's generally the the impression that i've gotten is that they see themselves as the audience of the show and they want to not have any questions about why how the story's moving and how they're supposed to i guess feel in any given moment mm -hmm. so they they really they really want and this is you know these these meetings happen i'm just an observer in these meetings you know oh, okay. um uh, and they're, they're usually over the phone. It's usually done on the phone with the producers in the room and the editor and the, the head of the post-production department. And then somebody's in there taking notes. Mm. Um, and they will, they will say, you know, if a particular plot or story point is they're really hung up on, they'll want that changed. If they want the music to be more triumphant or to be, you know, more you know, somber, they'll, those are the notes that they'll make. It's very rarely huge major changes. It's just kind of helpful us as the audience to understand what's going on. Now, do you get any, do you have any creative input at all? Does anybody ever let you put in your two cents or no? Are you strictly out of all that? Um, it's, the, the opportunity exists. Uh, you, nobody's necessarily coming to you with uh, you know, qu questions about, you know, how should we, how should we go about this? Or, you know, what, what take should we use here? But um, on, on, on a lot of shows, um, Stock footage is kind of the responsibility of the uh, the, the post production coordinator, and finding a stock shot that ends up in the show, you know, that's kind of the creative okay. thing that you get to put in. You know, you 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 have to pick a, a selection of stock shots, and the producers, of course, approve it. But um, you know, you're you're at least giving them the you know the start, and you've you've sort of picked what you think is the best. Mm -hmm. um, you do have access to the showrunner and the writers when they're in there uh, doing cuts and stuff like that. And if they're open, you can absolutely talk to them, but it's, you're not really in a position to, to pitch anything, you know, or to, to change anything beyond sort of just as a, a very casual aside. So now can you explain to listeners what a stock shot is? Sure. A, uh, a stock footage is a, a image. Uh, generally, there's, there's still, you know, still photography and motion photography. Mm -hmm. It's something that some company owns that they will um, sell to other shows or productions to, to use in their, um, in their show. So it's something that your show did not shoot itself okay. and that you're paying someone else for permission to use in your show. Um, a lot of times that's things like, um, exterior locations. We can't actually fly to, uh, the Yukon to shoot the Yukon, but we can <laughs> certainly find someone who's, who's has the footage of that and, uh, you know, pay them a licensing fee for which we can cut it into our show and, and, uh, and use that to help tell the story to the audience that, Oh, now we're in the Yukon or we're in Hawaii or wherever okay. it needs to be. And that, uh, that stock shot is just a very simple, they're very rarely on screen for more than a second, but that, that little visual cue says, Oh, you know, it establishes a location. It establishes a time of year, uh, uh, establishes time of day. You know, it can really just help tell the audience like, Oh, okay. Now I realize we've 
you know, gone to an entirely different location. Um, if you're watching Alias, uh, and years ago, I guess, but they would always have those stock shots, you know, Budapest and, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. and all the various locations where they go around the world. They didn't actually go there and shoot those. They just put a, put a, a low, you know, some words over the screen and, and call it a, you know, and say that they're, that's where they are, but they're actually in, in Burbank. That makes it a whole lot easier, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, if, if you have to send a crew to somewhere, you know, it's tens of thousands of dollars. If you want to pay for a shot, it's, you know, a couple thousand at most. And that's, um, you know, if you're licensing a very specific image of a famous building or something like that, yeah. um, which often there's rights issues and things like that, which are um, usually handled at the studio level. Um, you know, we pick the shots and then the studio will say, oh, we can't do that because we'll have to pay too much for it. Yeah. But um, generally speaking, they're just a few hundred dollars. So it's, it's a very cost effective way to take your show around the world, you know, and, uh, and to help t- tell your story without having to rent a helicopter and do all that. Yeah. Stuff. Uh, how do you, um, interact with the cast much or are you strictly in the office? Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, if, if, uh, for ADR, uh, when we're fortunate enough to be, uh, have the actors on set and a, uh, a ADR facility nearby the set, um, then we'll, we don't have to go through their management and stuff like that. We just get the actors, pull them off the stage and, uh, and put them in the ADR in the recording booth, you know, which is just a simple, you know, recording booth. Uh, so you, they're not huge facilities. And then I'll, you know, I will, I'll get a chance to talk to them and stuff like that, but they're, they're in their world, you know, the actors and, and, and post-production is very much in its world. And, uh, it's, it's, you know, there's not a lot of interacting between the two. Now, have you ha- ever had any security issues or, or security failing on one of your shows? Um, I was on a show where, uh, the pilot aired and I think within half an hour of the pilot airing, it was up on porn site. <gasps> oh, so these things happen. It turned out it wasn't our department. It was people that we had given it to who should be trusted people. But, you know, you know what I mean? It, it, it happens. Uh-huh. And, and we, we, we did what we're supposed to do. So we were okay in that, in that regard. And then it, it fell upon us. We didn't immediately know who's pirating this stuff. <laughs> so it fell upon us as, as the post-production department to figure out how to find out who it is who's, who's putting this stuff up because it was somebody in the, in the chain. And that's a lot of times of what's happening is it's, it's not some random hacker. It's, it's somebody in the chain who's for some reason putting it online. Wow. So yeah, it, it's a real thing. It happens. It happens a lot. Um, you know, and as security minded as you are, mm-hmm. as soon as it, it leaves your office, you know, like I said, we, we gave it, we gave it to someone and it turned out to be, you know, an international affiliate. And, you know, it's like, we're giving them the show. We can't, we can't control that. So, so now how has the industry changed or has it changed since you started? I know you haven't been doing it for, for tremendous long amount of time, but have you seen any changes or do you see any changes that are coming? Um, in post-production specifically is, is technology based and technology drives so much of what we're doing. And even in my, you know, relatively brief career in post-production, I've seen just how faster internet speeds can make a huge difference. Yeah. Um, be- because now, just a few years ago, they, they were more expensive and they made the DVD distribution method, you know, more cost effective. But now internet speeds have made that sort of a thing of the past. Um, and I, what I see coming is, again, as the internet gets faster and faster, a lot of what the post-production assistant does is delivering hard drives. And if you can, have, instead of having him drive across town for three hours, if you can just upload it in an hour, mm-hmm. you know, that sort of really changes the dynamic of what uh, the post-production assistant is going to do. And then again, as ed- editing system and the software and the hardware becomes better, it, it makes the editor's job that much easier and they can move that much faster. So I think it's a technology improves, there's going to be actually kind of an increased demand for faster, faster. And things yeah. are going to be expected much sooner. And, um, and things are going to be changed almost on, you know, on the fly. It's, you know, something now an editor requires a fairly large computer system mm-hmm. that's dedicated just for editing. Um, but, you know, in 10 years, you could do it on 
whatever the iPad 15 or whatever. Right. Coming out that year. <laughs> right. And, and it could be done on the set, on the fly as they're shooting, yeah. you know, it could be done, you know, so all the post-production is, is very, very much driven by technology improvements and uh, is, it's going to get closer and closer to the set and it's going to get faster and faster. And, you know, there's, there are going to be p- bigger demands on, on the post-production, but Fortunately, they're still going to require people to do it. <laughs> so, yeah, that's what I was. I was just going to say that. Do you foresee that the technology is going to get so crazy, you know, advanced that it, it might speeding everything up? It might take away some jobs or hours for the job, or you know what I mean? It, it might. Um, I think. I, I think specifically, like I said, the, the post production PA is is really the one most in in danger of that okay. because a great deal of their function is just moving information around. And yeah. it, if you can do that on the internet, then why not? Mm-hmm. However, somebody still needs to buy lunch every day. <laughs> so I mean, there's there's still that reality is you still need somebody there for that. Plus, you know, the office supplies and keeping the fridge stocked and all that wonderful PA stuff. You know, there still needs to be a person to do that. So I don't know exactly how that will change. But um, yeah, the editor, I think, like I said, they could become closer to to the set right there with the director and producers as things are being shot mm-hmm. because the technology could improve in that way. And then, of course, visual effects. Uh, right now, I mean, what you can do in a month in visual effects will be done in a week, in a few years. You yeah. know, And what they do now in a month used to take six months. So, um, you know, they, they get, they get more realistic, they get, uh, you know, more compelling and, and cheaper, you know, as, at the same time. So it's, it's definitely going to be a, a good thing for those of us who like, uh, you know, effects driven stuff right. and who are interested in, in, in visual effects is that it's going to become, you know, a lot of shows in their budget, they sort of have two big visual effects moments. Uh, they have one in the beginning and one in the end, and then that's really all they can they can afford. Mm-hmm. But as it gets cheaper, you're going to have you know nonstop explosions. I mean, for better yeah. or for worse, right. you know, and all kinds of amazing stuff that you can come up with that is sort of only features could do is going to get you know moved into television as well. So, who what would you suggest to someone who's just starting out and they want to do your job? Uh, what do they need to know? Who do they need to know? Is there any any kind of like special skill skill set that they should have? What what do you think about that? Um, you do need to know post production to be a post production coordinator, um, but to be a production assistant, um, I, to start off for everybody in, in the film industry is just find somebody who already does it and find out where uh, you know they can um, where you can get in as any kind of PA. Um, and through that, you can make your inroads into the field, I think, you know, that you're more interested in. Um, and then once you do get into post-production, just learn everything that the coordinator does and how to do it. And, uh, and you can, you know, move up to being a coordinator. Um, and, you know, that's my plan on, on for, you know, everybody is so you just got to, uh, learn. You know, always have to pay attention and learn as much as you can because the more you know, the more valuable you are to to any given team, and uh, right. you know that's always a good thing. Right now, when you see PAs and when you work with them, what do you expect from them? What do you want to see? What What do you want from them ultimately? Uh, um, I like to think I'm not particularly demanding. Um, it's just a, a function of making sure that you're where you need to be. I know the, the post-production PA job can be very hectic. And, uh, you know, so I expect them to keep track of all of the things that they're supposed to do, you know, and, and I also would like to see that they're interested in, in moving up and, and learning more. Um, but beyond that, you know, showing up on time and, and doing your best to keep a good attitude through all the crazy hours and crazy demands that are going to be made of you, you know, that's probably the most important thing is just maintaining a, a, a positive work environment. And for the rest of the crew, um, how can they make your job easier or harder? For the, for the rest of the crew, I think fortunately for post-production, we're a little bit insulated from that in that we, we get, we get the dailies that were shot the previous day. Um, you know, and we don't have any control over what they shoot or, or, you know, if they don't give us what they're supposed to, that's, that's on them, not us. I mean, obviously that makes our lives much more challenging. Um, 
I, I would I would say the only thing that they that makes our life harder is for them to to not give us what we need in enough time uh, and we're scrambling. So we expect something from the production office so we know what kind of uh, inserts we're going to be using um, and, or you know what kind of continuity issues or things like that we'll need to be to be focusing on. And if we get that at a, you know the last second, then it makes our lives, of course, that much more. But if we get it ahead of time, you know everything's prepared and everybody's everybody's happy. Awesome. So now what's the best part of your job, do you think? of Out of everything, what's the best thing that you like about it? Um, out of everything, I think it's in post-production, you get to see the whole show get made. Uh, when I was a set PA, you're there for the day, you're there for the filming, and then you're just there for the next day and the next day and the next day. Uh, but with with post production, you receive the dailies and you get to see it all the way from uh, you know raw raw uncut dailies to a final polished colored visual effects final music final sound version. And I I think that's really you know you're 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 putting that out into the world. You're not just uh, you're not just doing a job. You're creating something. You know, and um, that's I think to me is really very fulfilling. And then you get to, you know, occasionally go home and, and watch the show that you made. And, and, and like I said, as you know, when, it, when a stock shot or something like that, that I, that I was particularly fond of makes it into the show. I, I have a little bit of pride there. There's, <laughs> there's my, my, little, my little fingerprint on, on the show, you know, in my small way. So if you were the king of Hollywood and you could do anything differently, you could change anything, you could do it your way. What would you do differently in, in the position that you're in? If I was the king of Hollywood, I think the only thing that I would say is probably a common thing is I wish we could work a slightly less crazy hours. That that's really my thing. As far as what the post production coordinator does, uh, it's it's interesting and it's challenging, and um, I, you know I would like for there to be more. But as it currently exists, you know it's a uh, uh, you know it's a very good place to be to learn what it is to to make television and and um to advance your career in that industry i I think so well my dear you have a good night thank you so much for joining us thanks for having me and um yeah it was great thank you so much hopefully we will meet one day but you won't know who i am but i'll know you it's entirely possible we've already met, huh? <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> All right, Zach, you have a great night. You too. Bye-bye. And that's it for Crew Call. If you'd like to support the podcast, remember to click the Amazon link on the Tapa website before you go shopping. It doesn't cost you anything, and Amazon gives us a little kickback. Everyone wins. And if you like what you've heard, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. Good or bad, we really appreciate the feedback. Thanks to Zach for the interesting discussion about Post. Tune in next time to hear from the assistant to John August and producer of the podcast, Script Notes, Stuart Friedel.